الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everybody, and welcome back to Rosie's Corner. And to start off to all of my fellow Muslims, Eid Mubarak, and I hope you guys had a wonderful month of Ramadan. Now, the Rosie's Corner team has been working nonstop to get this video out to you guys, and I am so excited to finally be recording this, and let's get started. So today, we are going to be talking about the authenticity of the Qur'an. Now, to start off, what is the Qur'an? Now, the Qur'an was the final revelation sent by God to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The original manuscripts of the Qur'an have survived centuries and still exist in its original state. The Qur'an's message is universal and for everyone. It is for every human of every race, every color, ethnicity, and nationality. It provides guidance in every aspect of human life. The Qur'an also provides hope and guidance for a world in turmoil, but still keeps the exact same message of the oneness of God and worshiping only one God, which is the same message that Prophet Noah, Abraham, David, Moses, and Jesus, peace be upon them, preached. This scripture gives answers and a solution to all of life's questions. It is a book that was, is, and will be so advanced that Western scholars have not succeeded in explaining how a book like the Quran was able to emerge at the time and place that it did. Now, I have heard a lot of different theories about who produced the Qur'an. I have heard the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, wrote it. I have also heard the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, copied past scriptures. I have heard that Christians and Jews have helped Muhammad write it. And the main one that I have heard is that Satan helped Muhammad, peace be upon him, write the Qur'an. And so we are going to talk about each and every one of these. Now, I have heard that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, wrote the Qur'an. And I can tell you that all scholars, including Islamic and Western scholars, all agreed that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was illiterate, which means that he could not read or write. But for the sake of it, let's consider that Prophet Muhammad was the one who wrote the Qur'an. There are thousands, and I mean thousands, of authentic quotes and sayings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And these are called the Hadiths for the people that don't know. And these are completely different linguistic styles than the Quran. Even like basic Arabic speakers are able to recognize the difference. In December 2012, the Literary and Linguistic Computing Journal published a research conducted by linguistic experts about the Hadith and Quran. Now, these two were put to different tests, and th the study was very lengthy and advanced, and if you guys are interested, you are more than welcome to Google it and read it um, on your own. But at the end of the study, it was concluded that the Quran and the Hadiths are two independent texts authored by two different authors with different styles in their vocabulary, linguistic structures, and their mindset. Now, the Qur'an makes many bold prophecies. Are they true? Are they false? Now, did Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, think of these? Or were they inspired by God? And we're going to go through a couple of them. Chapter 30 of the Qur'an, verse 2 to 5. And at the time of this verse, the two world superpowers were the Romans and the Persians. Um, which, I mean, now is kind of comparable to today's America and China. Uh, but this surah was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, around the year 615. The surah mentions the Persians' defeat over the Romans that took place in 614. The prophecy that the Romans will defeat the Persians within three to nine years is made. And the Romans did defeat the Persians in a series of battles that began in 622, an impossible victory at the time. Now, if Muhammad was writing the Qur'an on his own, how would he have been able to know what would happen in the future? More importantly, why would he risk the chance of getting it wrong? Why would he risk losing his followers and his status? And lastly, most of the people that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was preaching to at the time were Meccan pagans who supported and liked the Persian pagans. If he just wanted a following for his own sake, why would he tell the people that he was preaching to that the ones that they favor were 
would lose a series of battles. A false prophet tells people what they want to hear, not what they don't want to hear. Now, in the Canaan, chapter 48, verse 27, it mentions the story of how Muhammad, peace be upon him, and about 1,400 of his followers, a small number compared to thousands of pagans who controlled Mecca at the time, were denied access to mosques in Mecca and were turned away to go back to Medina. Now, the Quran makes the promise that Muhammad and his followers would eventually enter Mecca freely. Had this been from Muhammad, it would have been extremely bold to say this. And he would have risked, again, his status and his followers if this didn't actually happen. And let me tell you that to this day, his followers are able to enter Mecca to worship freely and they are actually the only ones that are allowed to enter Mecca. Now, in chapter 80, verse 1 through 10, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, becomes very agitated with a curious blind man who was interrupting his conversation with another man. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is criticized for giving attention to one man and not the other. So you false prophets are self-glorifying, which means that they do not humble themselves to admit one wrong. In the Quran, chapter 9, verse 42 and 43, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is criticized for allowing some of his members of the Muslim army to not advance in the battle against the pagans. He did so without the permission of God, and he was rebuked in the Quran for doing so. Why would Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, rebuke his own actions and then write about it? Now, for time's sake, I'm not going to talk about all of uh, these verses, but there are so many more verses like this through the Quran, and you're more than welcome to investigate these verses on your own. Now, let's consider that the self-blaming verses was a deceptive plot purposely included to create a facade to make people believe that Prophet Muhammad did not write the Quran. Now, for this to be true, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would have had to be a liar. And here's the thing. Your opinion, my opinion, the skeptics' opinion, the Islamophobes' opinions, it doesn't matter here. The okay. opinion that matters is those who personally knew Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, what did they think of him? Did they think of him as a liar? Now, Prophet Muhammad was given the title Al-Amin the trustworthy one. His reputation of being trusted was so known that people, including his enemies, would give him their valuables when they would go on long trips or battles away from their home because they knew that it would be kept safe. Now, let's talk about the characteristics of a false prophet. And I know that a lot of people who are watching this video are Christians and follow the Bible. So we're going to go through the characteristics of false prophets according to the Bible. Now, according to the Bible in 1 Timothy 6, 20 to 21, a false prophet, what they say does not line up with God's words. Now, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, preached that only God and God alone should be worshipped, which again is the same message that came from previous prophets. So according to Nehemiah 6, 8, what a false prophet says does not line up with the facts. And I want to read something to you guys. John 8, 44. It says, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature. For he is the liar and the father of lies. He was a murderer from the beginning. When I read this verse, it honestly just makes me think of how Paul used to persecute Christians. And now Christians worship Paul. Like I feel like they worship more Paul than Jesus. But anyways, I encourage you guys to look into this further on your own. According to 1 Peter 5 verse 2 to 4, it is said that a false prophet, whatever they say, is filled with appeals for your money. Now, Prophet Muhammad was offered money and riches to leave the teachings of Islam. He was offered everything, and yet he didn't accept it. Now, 
it's funny because to me, I, what I've always known is that pastors, that's what they do. They take money from the congregation to themselves. But again, that's something that you guys can look into on your own. And last but not least, Deuteronomy 18, 20 to 22 says that a false prophet, whatever they say on behalf of God is just plain wrong. Now, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, spoke things that later on came to pass. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, preached what previous prophets preached. Now, according to what we read about a false prophet, according to the Bible, was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, a false prophet? Was Prophet Muhammad self-glorifying? No. Did Prophet Muhammad talk about himself in the highest regards in the Quran? The Quran holds no like personal information on Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Prophet Muhammad is only mentioned four times in the Quran, and the Quran holds information and speaks more highly of previous prophets than the Bible. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, refers to himself as only a man to deliver a message. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a humble man, was a humble prophet. Now, for the people that don't know, there is a chapter in the Quran that is titled Miriam, which is Arabic for Mary or Jesus's mother. So she has her own chapter. And now you could ask yourself, why is she bringing this up? What does this have to do with the authenticity of the Quran? The Quran raises Mary's status. It puts her as the most honorable woman in the world. She is mentioned more times by name, which is 34 times, than in the Bible. She is mentioned more times than Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Not only is she mentioned more times than Prophet Muhammad, she is also mentioned alongside her son, but she is also mentioned 11 times alone, which gives her a separate honor from Jesus. Now, why would Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, speak about Mary in such high honor? Had the Quran been written by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, why would he speak about Mary in the way that he did? False prophets give themselves and their families more honor and recognition than others. Why would he have chosen Mary, who belonged to a different tribe from a different era, and raised her status? Why wouldn't he have chosen his own mother, his wife, his daughter, and raised their status and given them honor too? Never once are any of these women mentioned in the Quran, despite Muhammad having loved them. Now, I want to talk about the challenge set in the Quran. The Quran presents a challenge, which is found in chapter 17, verse 88, to all humans to produce a book, a chapter, a passage, and finally, just a verse like that of the Quran. The bold claim is made that this challenge will never be met successfully. What human author of any book do you know who would dare make this challenge, especially one who was an unliterate shepherd, who was not a scientist, not a philosopher, not a physicist, not a poet, not anybody who had any type of education. How could they have written something like the Quran? Now, a German professor and a doctor of philosophy uh, named Angelica Neuer, she stated that nobody in history has ever been able to successfully challenge the Quran. And it has brought embarrassment to Western scholarship that to this day, they are unable to explain how such a book could have been produced in the 6th century Arabia. Now, let's look at the theory that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, copied previous scriptures. Muhammad's life has been documented in great detail, and Western and Islamic scholars can agree that Prophet Muhammad was illiterate, which means that he could not have read the Torah or the Bible. It also means that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, could not have written the Quran. In order for Prophet Muhammad to have copied previous scriptures, that would have meant that there had to be an Arabic Bible translation, which the Arabic Bible translation was published sometime between 859 and 867. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he died in 632 AD, which was centuries before the Arabic translation. So there was no way that 
Prophet Muhammad could have copied previous scriptures because he didn't have the Arabic translations. Now, how could Prophet Muhammad have copied previous scriptures given that they have such major differences? One of them being, and this is only one of the multiple examples of the differences that there is in the scriptures. So in Genesis, during the time of Prophet Joseph, sovereign is referred to as a pharaoh, which means that he is the head of his people and he is worshipped as a god. Now in the Quran, sovereign is seen as a king. So he is still the head of his people, but he is seen as human and he is not worshipped as a god. Now, archaeological discoveries have recently determined that the sovereign during the time of Prophet Joseph was not divine and was not a god. So how did Prophet Muhammad know to not copy this part? How did Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, know that the Bible historically was incorrect and to change this to a more historically accurate title. Now to discuss the theory that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, wrote the Quran with the help of Christians or Jews. Now, Mecca consisted entirely of pagans and idol worshipers before and during the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Everybody was a pagan. There was no major communities practicing any other religion. And they had never known the concept of worshiping a single God, only one God. When Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, began to call people, his people, to monotheism, they persecuted him because their entire economy and infrastructure was heavily based around paganism. So why would someone continue to preach something despite being persecuted and attacked? But let's say that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, wrote the Quran with the help of Christians or Jews. Now, the first Christian that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, met was during his adulthood. And his name, I don't want to mess it up, but it's it's here on the screen. And he was an Arab Christian priest. Now, he didn't have a physical Bible, a physical translation of like the Arabic Bible, uh, but he was very well versed. Now, could this man have been the source of who helped Muhammad write the Quran using previous scriptures? The answer is no, because Muhammad had met him after the revelation had begun to come to him and after he had started preaching monotheism. And so eventually this Christian priest who was well-versed in Christianity did accept Muhammad as a prophet who fit the characteristics of former prophets of the Torah and the Bible. And he eventually embraced Islam. Alhamdulillah. But let's examine the possibility that Muhammad had met other Christians who taught him the scriptures, they could have helped write the Quran. How could a Christian have taught him to write in the Quran a verse like chapter 5, verse 72? Those who say the son of Mary, who is the Messiah, is God, has certainly fallen into disbelief. Why would a Christian tell Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to write this? Why would a Jew tell Prophet Muhammad to write verses like chapter 5, verse 82. The most bitter towards the believers are the Jews. Or chapter 3, verse 45. Oh Mary, God gives you good news of a word. He will be the Messiah. Why would the Jews write something like this when to this day, Jews reject the son of Mary, Jesus, as the Messiah? Now, the theory that I have heard the most is that Satan helped Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, write the Quran. Now, let's examine the possibility of Satan deceiving Prophet Muhammad and helping him write a book that would help deceive billions around the world. Let's examine this. So the very first surah in the Quran is called Al-Fatiha. And it goes, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا صراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم ريح المهضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين 
If I said anything wrong, I apologize. That's just how I've learned it and that's how I hear it. But anyways, the very first surah in the Quran, which I just recited, it's called Al-Fatiha, which is the opening. And Muslims read this during every single prayer. Now, Muslims pray five times a day, which means that it is said, this opening, this opening chapter, it is said at least, at least five times a day. But it is also used before reading the Quran. So anytime that a Muslim goes to read the Quran, they say this opening chapter, and then they proceed to read the Quran. Now, this surah is only seven short sentences that, again, is memorized by all Muslims. And it calls to praise God alone and seek refuge from Satan. Now, Satan from the beginning of time only wanted one thing, and that was for worship to go to him and not to God, the only true God. So now why would Satan write a book and within the first passage tell his readers to seek refuge from him? Nobody would even make it past the first page. Now, throughout the Quran, there are verses that degrade the authority and power of Satan. I have listed a few of these verses, Quran chapter 26, verse 210 to verse 212, Quran chapter 28, verse 15, and chapter 35, verse 5 through 6. Now, why would Satan degrade himself and admit his lack of authority to his readers? Why would he deliberately call himself a deceiver and one who deceives people to follow others besides God. If Satan was too proud in the Garden of Eden, what would make him write a book where he calls himself all of these negative attributes and put God at such a high place? Think about that. Guys, like me, many people here are born Christians and have learned very little about Islam or the Quran. And the few things that we were taught or the few things that we did learn are mostly inaccurate information. There are many people out there that will learn about Islam and the Quran from non-Muslim sources. But what do you expect to learn if you're not learning from someone who is truly practicing Islam? You can't go to learn mathematics. You can't go learn algebra from an English teacher. So why would you go to someone who is not practicing Islam to go learn about Islam, to go learn about the Quran? I am not telling you to choose Islam as your faith, although I did. I am simply inviting you to investigate the Quran and investigate your prior beliefs that you have been taught about the Quran and Islam. I encourage you to make an informed decision. And as always, guys, read, read, read. You never know what you will find when you read. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope that you guys were able to learn something from this video. And inshallah, we'll be posting more videos like this. Make sure to like this video. Make sure to comment what type of content you guys want to see. Make sure that you guys subscribe. And if you guys want to join Rosie's Corners Insiders, make sure to hit that join button down below. And I will see you guys in our next video. And may Allah always be in your corner. Bye.